What up, my freaks? Ruinous Insight here with part 15 of my Total War Warhammer 3 modded Blood Dragons Immortal Empires campaign. So as we saw last time, another quest complete and another one of these unique units unlocked. The Oathbound Revenants, though to be fair, I'm not yet sure which army we're going to put them in. We still have the Black Grail Squires, the Phyrus Jur Palace Guard, and the Jade Ronin to unlock, which we're looking towards getting as soon as we can and okay this is related to the battle of the library of nong chang which we're gonna have in four turns then we just have library of uh, castle carcassonne and lamia both of which we are headed towards right now uh once again yeah not so sure about those band reverence in terms of their army because mr rabe who was the legendary hero associated with them and got killed off or not killed off but at the very least assassinated immediately upon spawning which was was both hilarious and irritating. Uh, he'll be back up and running and then we'll figure out what to do with his army. Now in terms of what we're doing this time, we've got a pretty big battle up ahead by the looks of it. Uh, Abrash is going to take out this little army here, Veragnaxotas and the uh, orcs therein, but right here at the Vale of Woe, we have a full orc stack, plus a full orc war, or at least near to it, plus Court of the Cruels, relatively elite stack, and the defense of Garrison with the defensive structure at the Vale of Woe. Basically four stacks that we can fight together in one while Abarash's army is damaged. So they may actually give him something of a challenge, which I'm pretty darn excited for. And we're going to jump into that in a... well, I guess... Right. Does Zacharias need to do anything? I was about to say in a few seconds. Oh, Zacharias, you're going to attack Fort Saul. Hmm. Alright, here's how we'll do this. We'll separate it a little bit. We will declare war on Grimgor's Ard boys. I think. Hmm. Wait. I also wanted to peace out, or to at least try to peace out with the uh, uh, with the Western Provinces, Cathians, because I really don't want Wallach babysitting Nong Chang. He could go and grab Lamia much, much faster if he leaves this place. Uh, let's talk to these guys. Oh, okay, they're immediately willing to peace out. We could even possibly go with a non-aggression pact if we declare war on... The Blessed Dread, the Ordered... No, that's us. And or Clan Ashen. I mean, we could declare war on Clan Ashen, but then they'll just be annoying Nong Chang as well. Or we could forego the non-aggression pact for now. Hmm. I could always ask them for the non-aggression pact later. I don't think we need their money, though. It feels like it's a waste of the ten... relationship. Would they do it for the declaration of war on Clan Ashen? They would. And they would. I kind of want to borrow Cathian units. On the other hand, we could defeat Jaume. You know what? Let's check this. Here's how we'll do this. How necessary is it to defeat Jiao Ming with Aberash? But what do we get out of him? I mean, his own defeat trait is, I think, plus six armor. Uh, he gives a damage resistance of plus five percent in area, which ain't that bad. Which ain't that bad. I guess the real question is... Oh, wow. Defeat Yuan Bo is very nice as well. Ah, huh, even more damage resistance. Because clearly, we need more. And I know I sound like I'm saying that sarcastically, but not so sarcastically, because Aberesh does be, has become a lot more fragile. It doesn't make him quite fragile, but since we're using the uh, the Dragon's Lament, which gives him a lot more damaging capabilities, he has lost that 20% ward save that we were getting out of Heart Piercer, which makes him a lot more likely to lose his barrier, as he's been losing it in basically every fight, when he used to not lose it nearly as much. So it's certainly something we may want to take Take a look at in terms of getting him additional award save and like somebody pointed out in the comments as Zazel uh, gives us another 10% award save so we could stack those I'm still salty about Astrogoth being so far away but what can you do anyway you know what I think we may go after Jiao Ming doesn't necessarily have to be now but what we can do is peace out with him and I guess take his slight amount of money and then we'll see. He might redeclare war on us, or he might not, or we might send Aberash to hunt him and the rest of the dragons down, though I would think that we'll probably prioritize Yuan Bo over him. Especially as it'll be a heck of a trip to come down here, and we'd have to go through one of the uh, Riptides as well. Hmm. We shall see. Oh, Nakai does have a good defeat trait, uh, though I believe it's 
10 melee defense, which could be quite nice as well. And Sora Smite out of Krog Gar. And both Nakai and Krog Gar are just ancient beings and certainly worthy of a fight with Aberash. I think he'd appreciate that. But anyway, anyway, we'll fight with Aberash first, attacking Mr. Varignik Sotas. We will. We could directly declare war on you, or we could ask the war host of Jar. But you know what? Ooh! Whoa, 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 whoa. Zatan and Kolek are right here. Oh, we may have to take a detour to kill them both. They're really close by. Unexpectedly close by, I should say. Hmm, okay, wait. You're at war with the Greenskins. We need to try to divert them both towards the Greenskins. You are not at war with the Greenskins. Okay, wait. Wait, see if I can figure this out. Declare war on the Greenskins, who are strength rank 2, and may provide us a few more decent fights here. Oh, you know what? Let's ask Goldtooth. Did you... Oh, Goldtooth is dead. Oh, they probably really... Wait, drew in war? Ah, I was hoping they'd give us a decent amount of cash for it. Not that we really need the cash, but fine, fine, fine. I'll just declare war straight up. Who cares? Alright, we'll declare war on them. Then... We'll kill off these armies, and then we'll see if we can't get Kolek to join the wars as well, and hopefully divert him southward towards their territories where Aberash can hunt him down. And next, Aberash, you're going to go directly for this army. We're going to have to fight this because uh, uh, we don't want to get... Oh, close victory. Yeah, it might be worth a fight. We are damaged, and we don't want to get more heavily damaged because if we do, the next four stacks that we're going to fight at once are going to be all that much tougher, and we're already hurt as well. Before we get started, engagement threshold has been reached, so this will be an hour episode as well as for the entire campaign. So far, though, we're starting to uh, we're starting to drop a little bit, but the engagement threshold remains at 300 likes and 40 comments, and the next episode will be an as well. For now, let's uh, let's rip some green skins apart. All right, here we go again, starting off easy with this battle, I would wager, but uh, let's just say I have a feeling we're in for some grand, massive battles uh, today. Anyway, we're going to head directly towards the enemy army with both Aberash and his uh, uh, and his flyers. Nice that he has an air force. He's going to go after the enemy Black Orc Big Boss, who will hopefully turn around and actually fight. Oh, there we go, while our flyers hopefully surround and destroy those two death hags with the uh, Bloodkin Aspirant helping out as well. Gonna get a little bit of duel going here while we wait for the rest of our army to arrive. Aberash might cast a few things as well, here and there anyway. And we'll try to hold off a decent amount of the enemies with some zombie raising, some rays dead, in order to allow our flyers, led by the Aspirant, to kill off these uh, River Troll hags. Definitely don't want them repeatedly casting throughout the battle. Looks like Aberash has defeated uh, the enemy Black Orc Big Boss, who has lost his head, but, well, let's just say that was always going to happen. Uh, our main army, or at the very least our infantry, have nearly arrived. We're going to pop the phantoms of the first keep onto the field and send them directly through some gobble archers so that they leave us alone for a little bit. Aberash will uh, join the fray to help out against uh, the enemy uh, river troll hags and then cast one of his rain of blood and fires uh, just as our uh, units arrive to uh, keep the enemy locked in place. We might get a few hits into our own line but we should be able to heal them up uh, just fine. And there we go, the overcasted version of that spell is truly obnoxious in terms of the uh, damage that it can deal, though I suppose the regular piercing bolts of burning are uh, very damaging as well. Anyway, these units that were trying to get around the bend to uh, help out over on this side got absolutely wrecked between the spells and their poor positioning. Uh, but we got the second enemy army arriving onto the field, so and the enemy does have more where that came from. Alright, the trolls are done, and now it's time to start moving our units to where the raised dead have been keeping a blob of enemies back. 
And once again, you just got to love a raised dead as a control spell. It is so, so useful for doing things like this. Keeping so many of the enemies from joining the fray while we destroy their, uh, their friends there and then head the rest of our army into the fray as well. Those trolls are about to have a pretty bad day as the blood dragon and neophytes and veterans move in, as well as our disciples of the path. And speaking of disciples, the Air Force has lifted off once again, and they'll probably find a few targets. To obliterate, there's really nothing in this enemy army that would stand a chance against them. Maybe if they got completely surrounded by trolls, but, uh, well, let's just say that's pretty darn unlikely to happen at this point. Aberash leading the, uh, uh, the main host now. Mostly because there were no more remaining enemy uh, lords or heroes to fight. We are going to try to clear this out reasonably quick, though, so let's get another piercing bolts or a brain of blood and fire coming down on those enemies. And I hear trolls don't like getting hit with fire either, so that should be pretty darn effective against them, forcing a decent amount of them to uh, run away, and it seems like they're terrified as well. The flyers have landed in the background, boar boys, and by the looks of it, a pile of gobos uh, standing against them, but this is just more meat for the grinder. Some of them might be threatening to our Bloodkin Aspirant, who by the looks of it doesn't have a crazy amount of splash damage, in terms of how many units he has, looks like it was a single, uh, uh, single Gabo goes flying. There we go. Well, slowly but surely, he will destroy them. Uh, battle will be ours soon anyway. Just gotta make sure our main force moves on in to help out the uh, Blood Canals. Front and Aberash himself has pretty much closed the distance as well. And there we go. Oh, I, like how he, uh, I like how he just ran through the uh, ranks of enemies there. Alright, a couple more hits. There's a charge coming in from that bloodkin. I'm gonna drop another piercing bolts, or rather rain of blood and fire. And so many gobos go flying. And beautiful. With that spell, it looks like the last of the enemies will rout, and the battle will be ours. But this was always going to be an easy one. Uh, just a uh, prep, a vanguard of the real force that we are going to fight. All right, there we go. Decent enough little fight. We did take some damage, but healed up mm, apparently most of it. One unit I remained dead. I guess I could have uh, taken another few seconds to heal a few more, but it's all good. Uh, Aberash was able to go wild with casting. Casting this time around, I usually don't bother casting damaging spells with him. However, since we were looking to clear out this battle a little bit faster uh, than previously, I thought that it would be a, uh, a decent idea. Plus, with him getting 500 kills, it was able to uh, max out his uh, uh, bonus damage to his sword, so he was hitting for 1.2k damage before buffs, which is pretty darn solid. Uh, it's certainly a great weapon to use when you cast damaging spells, uh, just to buff it up. Uh, even though it doesn't function as good as an infantry blender as that hack bill one but nonetheless uh pretty good sort of a uh, good uh, good at both things but not amazing at both things i would say but anyway uh we are going to heal up here mostly because we're about to fight another major battle and the money isn't as relevant to us right now uh hmm. Would you be able to? No. I was hoping to send him to the Vale of Woe so that we didn't have to deal with it ourselves. But I guess we'll raise it anyway, because we're going to run out of movement anyway. Ow. Well, nonetheless. Uh, we're going to raise it anyway. Anyway, enemy killed in battle, yada, yada, yada. We can ignore that. And we're going to do this little fight first. Mostly just to sort of spread out the fights. We will, of course, level before fighting, as we like to do. Uh, you don't need Deathly Vigor, as it's relatively useless. We can probably start leveling up those Graveguard, as the walls may, well, let's just say, be uh, fairly threatening to them. A leadership bonus is for you. There we go. And everything else is reasonably okay. We'll want to level up the exotic dead and the uh, blood dragon neophytes here, but these guys will always remain neophytes as we have the uh, double buffs for them, or at least we will once we actually occupy stuff. Ah. <laughs> uh. 
Yeah, too bad Karak Norn didn't stay at Dwarfen territory as it might have been tier 5 by now. Azor is tier 3, so it's useless. Yeah, I think Skaven Blight might be the only nearby mountain terrain. Ooh, maybe Massive Forkal is tier 5 by now. If we grab Carcass Sun, maybe we can head over there and uh, see what the orcs got and whether it's worth taking and turning into a blood keep. But for now, uh, let's level up Mikhail who hasn't gotten into an actual uh, big old fight for a little bit. Let's get him in Rage, Battle Cry, definitely Disciple of Aberration, Honor, or Death. But looks like we need rank 20 to get the Summon Warriors. Knights of Blood Keep will obviously get Deathly Vigor. And the Lost Sons, yeah, that's, a, that's via tech. We'll get you Honor or Death as well. Oh, there's two things called Honor or Death. Let's... Ah, but this one is or with a capital, and this one is or with a lowercase. Ah, that's how we differentiate. Uh, we could go for replenish, or we could keep going through this portion of the tree. Hmm. And max mana, so we could use a little bit more. In theory. Wind of Death could be useful. Uh, what do you have again? You have Soul Stealer. You don't have much in the way of casting. In fact, uh, well, you do have Gaze of Nagash, but uh, really no damaging spells. Well, okay, fine. Soul Stealer does damage, but it is also best used probably to heal him if it uh, comes down to it. I think we'll grab Wind of Death on you after we max out Replenish Troops, especially since training doesn't appear to be working on you. All right, let's hit these guys, and yes, we could auto-resolve, but I just don't trust the nearby presence of all those enemies. We're also going to grab the banner of Lamia. Between the episodes, I went ahead and bought a few of these things via the buying items tree, and this is a pretty darn strong banner. Melee defense plus 10 in an area. A small area, mind you, but a decent area nonetheless. Uh, we may want to pop it onto one of the ghostly units, or we could pop it on... Uh, or we could pop it on Mikhail himself. Depends on if we send him out to hunt things. Let's pop it on Mikhail. For now, I might swap it out to a regular unit, but the weapon strength plus 15 will probably be best used on somebody who can utilize it. And yet still stay near the rest of the, uh, the rest of the troops. The weapon strength of these guys isn't actually all that high or anything like that, so another 4 or whatever isn't going to be that much. But anyway, uh, we'll fight this manually, or yeah, let's fight it cinematically, and let's just hope that it... Uh, uh, that the desync doesn't hurt us too much. Yeah. Chasing perfection. Alrighty, here we go, a fort to battle. Certainly not going to be a lot of these throughout this campaign, and we'll see how well the enemy stands against us here. Fortunately, uh, Mikhail and Zacharias both can fly, and we'll, uh, well, uh, we'll dish out a ton of damage to the enemy units up on those walls. Crossbows and handguns up here. We certainly don't want them firing down into our relatively fragile graveyard. Speaking of the Graveguard and such, we have no rams, we have no towers, we are going to go up the walls in the old-fashioned manner. Uh, the Graveguard will raise the wall or raise their ladders primarily on the rightmost flank, though they are going to start getting bombarded by those mortars and we're going to have to try to clear them out as best we can. The uh, least protected would be the Phantoms of the First Keep and then following the Blood Dragon Neophyte Warriors, who are going to be the uh, sort of center line and allow the Graveguard to hopefully not get hit by as many units. Otherwise, it's a matter of distracting as many enemy range units as we can to prevent them from firing upon the units as they climb. Although, in particular, the handgunners are probably not going to be able to do too much of that. It looks like the mortar crew is pretty much done, though Mikhail has taken a fair few a number of hits from the enemies. Uh, while he destroyed them, and he's got the Power of Darkness on him, so he's taking damage from that as well, but it looks like he can simply out-heal that. Uh, hmm. You shouldn't be standing still like that. Perhaps the, uh, well, perhaps there's a desync. In fact, well, there's been a desync in pretty much every battle, but that's all right. At the very least, our units are still fighting on top of the walls. And that's appropriate. I really love the uh, bl bright color scheme on our Graveguard as well. Certainly uh, the uh, uh, contrast against the yellow of uh, the enemy forces makes the actual fight very easy to watch. 
as we can clearly see what's going on. Looks like there's some great swords down there and some up here as well, but it looks like the walls will shortly be ours. We have taken a bit of damage on a few of our unit of Graveguard, but we've been just healing them pretty much non-stop. Uh, fortunately, unlike the Graveguard, who have a lot of units in each, or a lot of models in each unit, the Blood Dragon Neophytes and the uh, uh, and the Phantoms have very few, and thus we're able to go over the walls and then down again into the settlement proper and start mincing infantry. You gotta love watching those area attacks from those great swords on the Blood Dragon Neophytes. 68 weapon strength and 46 armor piercing, not too bad, though the regular state troops aren't heavily armored. Anyway, uh, they're going to have a pretty bad day though as the uh, Phantoms of the First Keep start hitting them in the back. Alright. Well, that blob is uh, just about uh, done for. We've got more Graveguard coming down from the walls and in a contest with more of those state troops. But the main uh, the main thing that threatened us here were the walls themselves, and they are no longer an issue, or specifically the towers on the walls. And since they're no longer an issue, we should most definitely win the War of Attrition or the Battle of Attrition without too much trouble. Granted, it's going to take a while for our Graveguard to actually destroy those infantry, but uh, the non-Graveguard portion of the battle all the way over here has been pretty much won, and soon the uh, Neophytes and uh, the uh, Phantoms will join the fray here and help the Graveguard out. In fact, it looks like a couple of the Blood Dragon Neophyte units have moved on in and left a bloody spot where they've charged. All right, Zachariah is going to move in to help as well. This must be uh, terrifying, quite literally, for the uh, uh, for the enemy units, and I'm sure a few of them will run away in terror shortly. Hey, yeah, yeah, another a volley from the enemy handguns going to try to take some pot shots at Zacharias, but I just don't see that being too much of a problem at this point in time. He's lost about 10% HP, but he can recover. Once again, the Graveguard are mostly here for the purpose of being an anvil. They've got a ton of melee defense on them, uh, but they're not going to uh, do too much in terms of damage. But, well, this is what they're for. This is why we summon them and why we have them in this army and uh, Edmund's army as well. Though I guess Edmund's army actually has some of the uh, Greatsword Graveguard. But I also like the idea of the Graveguard just slowly but surely overwhelming uh, the enemy. A, because they're uh, harder to bring down for the enemy as state troops because of their uh, defensive capabilities and their constant healing. So even if a few drop, they will rise back up. The mashy giggle and will destroy the enemy. Speaking of destroying the enemy, it looks like with that the battle is finally ours. The enemy will shatter and the fort will fall. Very nice. Very nice. No problem at all going over those walls. All right, very nice, very nice. We were uh, down about, I don't know, three to four hundred of our grave guard while they were climbing the walls, but certainly our invocation of Nehek, uh, well, raised every single one of them back up, which is great. Oh, invocation, where would we be without you? Uh, most damage looks like came from the Blood Dragon Neophytes and, of course... Of course, the Phantoms of the First Keep Warriors. It looks like we got solid damage out of Zacharias and decent damage out of uh, Mikhail as well. Uh, also, that fight gave me something to think about, or at the very least, uh, I'm thinking, or at least I have an idea about how to possibly minimize desyncs. Uh, probably wouldn't have been visible for that particular battle. Um, but maybe the next one. I have an idea. And the idea revolves around giving orders to units not based on attacking enemy units, but based on ground orders instead. Because the desync occurs and you tell a unit to attack another unit uh, during the replay, but that unit is elsewhere, not where it's supposed to be. So your units are running around doing nonsense things. But if you give them only ground orders, that shouldn't change as it's irrespective of the position of the enemy units, which could be a way to minimize the effect of that desync on us. So we'll see. But anyway, for now, we... Ow! 
It's not worth any metal. Oh, game, game. Why did I even bother with you? Uh, alrighty. Uh, I mean, I guess we'll still take it. There's no reason not to. We're not gonna raise a blood keep here, that's for certain. Alright, got a free man servant, and I guess we're going to keep traveling, though a non march stance. At least there's no fort to block us. Hmm. Alright. And we should be able to reach Castle Carcassonne reasonably quickly. And oh, it's owned by the Skaven as well. And oh, hopefully they haven't killed off all the Bretonian factions, because they have some good defeat traits. Hmm. Only something to consider. But anyway, uh, let's see. Aberash, it's your turn to fight. It's going to be a very fighty episode. Though I suppose in this particular campaign, every episode's been a, a pretty darn fighty episode. So there's that. Anyway, to the Vale of Woe, we shall go a Pyrrhic victory for Aberash's army. Eh? Well, that's what I like to see. Now, before we get into that, is there anybody we need to level up? Uh, unfortunately, none of the disciples are able to rank up to knights as yet. Uh, no, but the looks of it, no. I guess we're just getting on into it. All right. Four stacks, huh? Yeah, this should be a fun one. And it should be a very fun one, Aberash, and there will be plenty of units for you to cast a few things through, hopefully the gobos and stuff, in order to buff up your, uh, buff up your sword there. Away you go. Alrighty, here we go, folks. I gotta say, I am very, very excited about this particular battle. We've got so damn many enemies arrayed against us and lots of elites. The, uh, the orcs of the Darklands should provide a nice pile of meat shields for the high damage dealing Chaos Dwarfs, especially their elite units like their uh, Renders and their Kadai Fireborn and their Fire Glaives to actually pierce the armor of our units. So, and we'll see how we fare here. Now, we are going to send Aberesh directly forward into the enemy, most likely to or uh, to specifically go after the enemy Hell Cannon, and we'll summon our unit of Phantoms of the First Keep together with the other Flyers and go after the other Hell Cannon as well. We've seen in previous battles where those cannons were able to knock out a unit of uh, Disciples of the Path with every single shot, and we just don't want that happening again. Plus, I don't think Aberesh would appreciate his uh, uh, his children uh, getting killed off before they have a chance to, uh, you know, enter into a contest of blades. So we'll take care of the cannon real quick. It would be cool if the uh, hell cannons, like the uh, the vanilla hell cannons, uh, if they, uh, I don't know, if something happened and they got angry enough and started killing off their own crew, as I understand, as they are likely to do. But anyway, it looks like their crew is already nearly killed off, but the Hell Cannon still remains. Some enemy uh, Chaos Dwarf Warriors move in to try to stop Aberash from destroying it, but he'll use his enraged scream to uh, knock them away. Just a few more hits and hopefully the Hell Cannon will be silent. We have also managed to destroy the other Hell Cannon here with our... Uh, piles of flyers, though it looks like the enemy has certainly reacted to this and has surrounded them. Speaking of the enemy reacting, the uh, second, or no, the third and fourth armies have arrived on the field and the balance of power is only about 25, maybe 30 probably 25% in our favor. It's a lot of enemies, and we are going to get mobbed sooner or rather than later. Uh, Aberesh is surrounded, but obviously he doesn't care. Frankly, he could probably take mm, a lot of this by himself, oh, but it would also take absolute ages. We did hide our units of Disciples of the Path in this little copse of trees while those Hell Cannons were up, and we'll simply allow them to... Uh, uh, simply allow them to go out and find some enemy ranged targets to deal with. Now, there are a pile of enemy ranged and basic units here, and Aberash will cast the spell A just to, so that he can get out of here and actually duel enemy lords, and B to dial up his uh, numbers of kills a little bit so that he can hit a little bit harder. What's that put him up to? 334. We need 500 kills for his weapon strength to max out uh, due to his uh, uh, due to his current weapon. So a little bit more, and by the looks of it. All right, and finally, our other units are making their way in. I love watching those glaives uh, go. Hmm. 
And because of the glow on the, uh, well, tips of the, uh, uh, tips of the glaive there, they're very entertaining to watch fight, I think. Yeah, like this little, uh, swampy, mucky water that we've got to deal with. Now, Disciples of the Path, you're gonna have to hold off a lot, and I mean a lot of units. They're still moving on to the field, but there is, well, it's going to be difficult for you, and most likely. We do, however, have to focus down a few enemies while we hold off the main Orc and Dwarf Tide. Uh, the, gobl the Goblin Rock Lobbers here will be focused down by our Bloodkin Aspirant leading the, uh, uh, the Flyers in the same one. We'll take the same. It looks like Gorth the Cruel has already been pretty much defeated by Aberash. And another hit will probably bring him down. And down he goes, his corpse never to be found again uh, beneath the swamps there, or the polluted waters of the Darklands. It's probably not even water, industrial runoff or something. It just looks similar to the uh, swampy areas. Anyway, Aberash will move around and go after another enemy... Uh, hero by the looks of it, a demon smith who needs to be brought down. But in the meantime, we've started to take damage. The enemy elites, i.e. the bull center renders, the Kadai fireborn, there are some squig hoppers, some boar boy biggins, lots of armor piercing basically. Uh, infernal guard with fire glaives who even in melee do armor piercing. Uh, they've dropped this one unit of disciples of the path down to about 35% of their HP and they're still dropping. This one's also taking damage and these guys have started to take damage as well well, we're gonna have to be careful. We did set up our battlefield in such a way that the Disciples of the Path will be holding off the vast majority of the enemy forces, but as we can clearly see, these three are, well, not looking so hot. The Blood Dragon Neophytes and our other more fragile units are going to take hold of the left flank, hopefully destroy everything here, and then loop around to flank and destroy these guys, and, well, hopefully head probably to the center, at least in part, to help out the Aspirants, who are surrounded by the elite of the enemy. And just hold on, Aspirants, we're gonna do our best to keep them healed up, but it's getting very, very dangerous for them. Now, the reason I deployed them like this is mostly because I thought it would look cooler, and frankly, I was correct, it does. Uh, but uh, normally, when faced in such a situation, we're much better off going into a Death Star formation so that the units are not able to get surrounded in this manner. But obviously, you wouldn't get such great cinematic shots. And a lot of the uh, fighting that's done on this uh, on this channel is more to try to get the armies to sort of line up and uh, look good while fighting. It's rare that we have to go into the uh, uh, into fully tactical setups here. Ooh, this Disciple unit is very close to being destroyed now, down to about 10%, and this one's down to about 15 and this one's down to about 10%. Oh, no. <laughs> this is getting pretty darn dicey. I got to respect those Orky and Chaos Dwarf elites. On the leftmost flank, however, the enemy army is by and large collapsing, so these guys will soon be able to join their Disciples, uh, the Disciple compatriots in action. You just gotta run off the rest of those orcs. And this unit of disciples also has a, a pile of the uh, elite uh, blood dragon vets with them and a couple of units of blood dragon neophytes, so they're a little bit uh, less concerned. We have moved in our flyers and Aberash to join the fray over here as well, and just to try to get more units to protect our remaining aspirants as they're so badly damaged. This one has gotten a, a heal and is now back up to about 25% HP, as 15% was too low, though luckily we have so much leadership on them. They they have not begun to crumble away. We've also sent in our uh, our Disciples of the Path Knights who are working in the background to repart enemy ranged units to move in and help out and try to push their way through the enemy ranks towards the Disciples, which are so damaged. Now it's time to get the Disciples sort of moving into a single formation, blobbing up together and uh, allowing the, uh, let's say, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> and allowing the uh, more durable units uh, like the uh, like the inner circle units to protect them a little bit act as their meat shield while they get their heals up and running 
All right. Damn, what a battle. Six minutes, I mean, for a vanilla force, six minutes of straight non-stop combat is pretty darn solid. I guess this is just the answer. We just have to fight four stacks at once with Aberash's stack. Or maybe two stacks, but, you know, more hyper elite stacks. But anyway, a very, very good battle so far. And we've got a little bit more in the way of battle to go. Uh, looks like there is an enemy lord still alive and we have sent Aberash to get him. Hopefully he won't run away, and by the looks of it, he has been engaged, and a couple more hits from Aberash will bring him down. Aberash has also reached his 500 kill cap, and thus is going to do as much damage as he is likely to do. The enemy lord will run away from him, and it looks like with the enemy lord running, most of the enemy are going to start booking it out of there as well. We've managed to just hold on with the Bloodkin Aspirants, and it looks like the heals are bringing them back up. All right, the dwarfs are breaking, the orcs are breaking, and soon the battle will be ours. But it certainly, uh, it certainly took some work this time around. I think Gabara should be very, very happy with this one. He got to uh, duel a bunch of enemy lords, and his uh, his sons were truly true. <laughs> They're just having a little. They're just having a dance here. They're they're just dancing. All right. They uh, they want to emulate Wurzeg, but alas, no one can. Uh, no one can dance as good as Wurzeg can. But anyway, uh, yeah. Abarash's sons were truly tested and almost fell in battle here, and that's exactly what he wanted. Though to be fair, to some degree, a lot of it was due to the fact that the enemy has a pile had a pile of chaff, but they had plenty of elites to rely upon and do all that armor pierce as well. Anyway, we don't actually need to chase here, but we will take a few extra seconds to heal up those units that got so heavily damaged, as who knows, we may get hit by more armies, there may be more orcs just out of sight. And a heroic victory as well. Very, very nice. Ooh, very, very nice. What a glorious battle. Definitely the toughest battle we fought against vanilla factions and uh, the unlikely allies of the Darklands orcs with the uh, servants of the Conclave of the Chaos Dwarf main faction, as it were, or... Uh, I don't know, Castlin Steward faction of Jarnagrund. Uh, yeah, unlikely allies, and they certainly gave us a fight worth fighting. At the end of the day, we were able to heal up decently, but it was a close battle. All four of our Disciples of the Path warriors stuck in the middle of the enemy blob and hit, getting hit with so many armor-piercing enemies uh, almost died. Every single one of our Disciples of the Path warriors almost died. The units on the flanks, like the Blood Dragon Vets and the Neophytes, we're a lot safer, and obviously same with the Depth Guard and the uh, and Bloodkin Thralls, but we purposely keep kept them, rather, more or less out of harm's way. Uh, it's also interesting to see that the Circle of Blood and the Night Riders, uh, well, they all got great amounts of kills. Uh, they did about on par in terms of damage, or at least in terms of kills, and damage dealt compared to the Disciples of the Path Knights, which is pretty good. Though, at the same time, uh, their damage dealt as gold value was much higher because we were sending them against uh, much more hard targets, which does make sense. Sense. Aberash himself got about 90k damage and 655 kills, so fantastic job to him. And it looks like the standouts in terms of the Disciples of Path Warriors were this first one, 29k damage and 345 kills. Probably the one that was on the flank, on the leftmost flank, and uh, was holding off a ton of units effectively by themselves. Ooh, what a great fight though. Uh, we will... I mean, we gotta keep raising, we need, we need more metal. We're always running out of metal. And Aberash, you... Ah. <laughs> I was hoping he could raid, but that's fine. We've raised the place, and does that destroy the Servants of the Conclave? Indeed it does. Jarnagrund now belongs to us, and the Darklands orcs, instead of feeding the industry of uh, their former Dark Masters, they will feed the uh, martial skill of uh, the Blood Knights of the new Blood Keep at Jarnagrund. Uh, we're going to move you over here, Aberash. Say, stay relatively close to Jarnagrund in case somebody attacks it, though I doubt that they will. 
And we'll want to move up here to hopefully knock out both Kolek and Zatan and get their defeat traits. I also would like to talk to Kolek and ask you to join Morgan Scrimgore. 31. Damn, that didn't work. All right, well... That's a shame. Hopefully he doesn't return to the challenge stone. I don't know where he's going, though. But at the very least, Zatan is at war with these guys, so hopefully. Hopefully we can make some use out of that. Now, who's up next? Who still needs to move? Edmund von Sinclair. How's that witch hunter threat? Eh, uh, it's not that high. Uh, you need to go do something. We're keeping Todd alive just so we can get the defeat trade, and frankly, probably the same thing for the Fekin Knights. There's no real reason to keep Nordland alive, other than the fact that we may want to keep the Empire alive. Hmm. You know what, I think for now this army can sort of hang out. We've seen it fight a bunch of times, and there isn't really anything around this area that's going to be a threat to them. And I don't necessarily want them to destroy the Empire as yet. We're going to get a sort of Castellan Lord here at Middenheim as soon as we can, and then maybe we can send him to Norska or something, uh, just to get some nice fights there. Oh! Oh, no, I was about to say, destroy Kinkwata, but I'd like the Bellacor defeat trait on Aberash. In fact, if he goes through an Abyssal Riptide, he could probably grab uh, Luan at Kuhan and briefly take out uh, Bellacor and then head around this way. Depends. I mean, once again, it depends on how many of these defeat traits we actually want to farm. We're just doing it for, well, lore purposes and fun purposes. Not because we really need them on Aberash or anything like that. Anyway, Abyssal Revenant, we were going to have you raise Shalon Hupak. And, oh, there's like nothing here. Okay, fine. Uh, let's also put that banner of Lamia on... Mm, gotta be on one of the central melee troops, I think. At least for now. I'd be tempted to put them on the empty dead, but we're gonna probably upgrade these guys built to ships, so... Yeah. Anyway, raise this for now. And another four metal for us. This was not a tier five, and so not worthy of being blood keepified. Uh, you can go into an camp, though. And let's see how close we are to the next tier. Ah. Yes, we're good. And soon we'll be up to the next tier as well. We don't want to spend metal on bloodied weaponry, even though it does give us horde growth. And we just want to get to the Ordo Profundum headquarters and the obsolete shipwreck, which we'll actually be able to do shortly. Yeah. And uh, somebody suggests... Ooh, Itza, are you tier 5? No. Oh, but you will be eventually. And could thus potentially be another blood keep. If nothing else, just for the additional, uh, uh, just for the additional capacity. Uh, you are supposed to follow the Abyssal Revenant around. I don't think there's anybody nearby that can attack you, so just keep moving yes, this way and follow Abyssal. Uh, we might raise a few things, maybe Quetza, maybe Alter the Horned Rat, maybe loop back around to the Star Tower and the Fuming Serpent, because who knows, maybe the Skaven have a tier 5 here. Though, it's actually a little bit too close to the Awakening, so I'll think about it. Uh, but otherwise, as somebody suggested in the comments, it might be a good idea to send the Abyssal Revenant to the Galleon's Graveyard, take the Maelstrom for ourselves, since Noctilus, a.k.a. Nikolaus von Karstein, and the Dreadfleet have failed in their, uh, uh, well, attempts at conquering all and we can take that over. Not so much to conquer it, but, you know, to train up all of our Depth Guard. Actually, speaking of Depth Guard, are we high enough level on any of these guys yet to upgrade them? No, they're still rank 6. Really would like that uh, training trait. Speaking of, you have the training trait. Go on over to join the Abyssal Revenant. So we can start getting these guys nice and profundame. Which is why we're saving some of our martial valor. Anyway, let's see what else we've got around. Edmund von Sink. Okay, I already checked you, my bad. Uh, Reinhardt. Ah, yes. You. Continue on your relatively slow approach to Karak Dromar. I'm kind of hoping that they declare war on us so that we can fight them in the field, but that is a lot of Bugman's Rangers. They would be quite the problem, I imagine, for this army. It's still nothing but uh, Blitkin Thralls, granted. They are powered up significantly by virtue of Albrecht Nictus here, uh, but at the same time, he is not in... a very good state as yet, because he's only level 4. This is a very, very weak army. And we'll have to be relatively careful with it. Granted, the legends aren't going to die, but it's still something we need to keep an eye on. Anyway, that looks good to me. Let's double check our buildings, then let's go to... Diplomacy. And then we can head out to the uh, next turn. Uh, quick deal. 
What do we have here? Clan Ashen hunts a non-aggression pact, and they don't like our past treaties with these guys. All the Skaven seem to want to join us, but I just don't see that happening. Or at the very least, I don't see it being appropriate for our faction. From a loreful perspective, Itza wants to peace out. And it's probably a good idea not to outright destroy them in case we get to, to fight Gorok with Aberash. Though, to be fair, if Wallach defeated uh, Gorok without too much problem in a one on one, and so did the Abyssal Revenant, I really don't see Aberash uh, failing at the same. Alright, the rest of this, I guess, looks good to me. So, let's skip the rest of this. Unassigned skill points, characters, lords, not mood, and on the turn, see if anything interesting happens. Also, what were we going for through here? Just so I can try to recall. Ah, yes, yeah, so there's some really nice uh, buffs for various thralls and graveguard units, which I think is probably best to get as soon as possible. Yeah, too bad the uh, Ordo infantry but doesn't buff the thralls. They could really use that additional ward save, as they're so fragile by comparison. And, but alas, it looks like we don't get any ward save out of any of this for them, but we'll still get them all the upgrades we can. All right. In turn, let's try to head towards those next blood keeps or uh, keep libraries. Lots of our uh, new units raiding as well. Our new lords. I summoned a couple of, uh, you know, temporary lords just to raid locations. Uh, really? Really? Are you sure, sir? Are you sure about this? Uh, I'm honestly not even sure this is worth fighting. I mean, compared to what we just fought, it's half a WA and it's a very weak WA compared to the ones that we uh, had to contend with. Oh, but this will kill off the Mudkin Thralls. Okay, it looks like the game wants us to fight it. Well then, fight it we shall. It looks like it's an orc extermination uh, episode today. And we're getting some damn good fights out of it, yeah. All right, here we go again. Honestly, I'm kind of impressed that the AI actually decided to, you know, attack us themselves rather than waiting for us to attack them. But, uh, well, here we are. Here we are. Let's, uh, let's see what they can do here to take revenge. I suppose that this is probably a good reason as to why the, uh... Uh, the Grimgor Zard boys are the second most powerful faction on the campaign map after us. All this aggression and all these armies. We've destroyed several and they're still coming at us. And hopefully we'll be able to see more of that as Aberash uh, continues his way southward through the Darklands. Anyway, it looks like the enemy lord has been stopped and by and large and defeated by Aberash already. And here come the reinforcing armies. Granted, they're nothing like the uh, armies that we've already faced off against, but they are pretty numerous. If nothing else, though a few well-placed spells might be able to uh, diminish their numbers fairly quickly. They do have some black orcs in here, though, so armor-piercing coming out of that. And with 69 weapon strength, their damage, at the very least, is roughly on par with our own disciple units. Even if they are nowhere near as, uh, as a tanky. Anyway, the enemy lord will run, and we're going to send our disciples of the path in. And we don't get to uh, get the most advantage out of this as much, but here we're definitely going to take advantage. Four black dragon or zombie dragon breaths out of each one of these units. Look at the damage coming in. Those HP bars are dropping. The AI foolishly moves against us in a massive blob like this, and so they're going to suffer for it. Abrash is also going to cast his spells as well. Here comes the... Uh, Ah, uh, here comes the wall of blood and flame or something. <laughs> and then Aberash will move through the enemy lines and hopefully towards the enemy lord. These things will at least clear out the chaff. The wall basically does no damage to trolls or uh, uh, to black orcs, uh, but all the gobos will melt away to it. And I imagine a lot of the same can be said for how much damage we were able to deal with the, uh, with the Inner Circle Knights. 
basic units probably took the brunt of those hits. And here we go. Black Orcs have made their way to the front of the line, facing off against our own elite units. Well, we do have some blood thralls in here as well, but otherwise the battle is already going very much our way. Aberash will drop another one of his spells, but it looks like most of the enemy has moved away from that. Uh, but the chaff is in his way, and he'd rather fight the elites. And I think just a few more hits and the battle will be ours, in fact. I just gotta knock out these trolls and black orcs, which are a great combination, especially with the stone trolls in particular. And to send at us, certainly a solid amount of enemy units, but they just don't have the type of damage uh, that the Chaos Dwarves had uh, when they were working together. I'm actually kind of surprised that the uh, Servants of the Conclave and the uh, and Grimgorzard boys weren't at war with each other, but I imagine that Grimgorzard boys was at war with all the other Chaos Dwarf factions due to a version that may, may be programmed to ignore the uh, uh, the Servants of the Conclave. It's kind of like uh, Nagashazar and uh, the Sentinels of the Black Pyramid as well. And those are the factions that are sort of castellans of their location or stewards of their location, and they don't really, uh, and they don't really act as factions per se. But anyway, with that, the enemy army will drop. Uh, Rudiger came in just at the end there as well, but uh, yeah, we were quickly and easily able to clear those guys out. But uh, with doing this so quickly, we should have time to fight another big fight. <laughs> Alrighty, well, uh, the way that the enemy came onto the map kind of screwed them over there, but we got so much value out of the uh, zombie dragon breaths of our two flying units. They were able to hit a very solid portion of the enemy army and thereby, uh, well, crippled their chances of doing any kind of damage to our army. So, good job to them, good job to Aberesh as always. We are going to, I guess, heal up because, well, why wouldn't we? And it uh, looks like the Wrath of the Dark Lands is failing. Uh, peace treaty decline, obviously. We still want the Scarce Thing to feed trade on Aberash. As well as all the... Well, I mean, there's a lot of Legendary Lords concentrated over there that we want to uh, get to. Confederation between the Great Orthodox and the Ropsman. Unconcerned about that. Uh, Rudiger, Rudiger got a shield of Talos. And that's fine. I haven't decided who to give the uh, legendary items to, but, uh, well, pseudo-legendary items. Uh, but we'll figure it out. And then would you look at that? More orky armies and nearby. Certainly lots of them around. I see Zatan is still around there as well. And, okay, the map got turned around. I'm starting to get confused. There we go. It's supposed to look like this. Uh, summon receives plague. There's that tech research being completed and will immediately go into Defenders of Bloodkeep for the melee defense and armor for Ordo monsters, Lesser Undead, and Thrall Infant. Tree. Hmm. Yeah, in fact, the buffs for Hordo monsters. Okay, that's basically the only good one. I mean, the casual two punishment one is swell as well. Charge bonus and speed, I'm not sure that we care about. Charge bonus is completely useless on the Graveguard and the Skeleton Warriors and the zombies and all that. Uh, it is decent on the. Uh, on the monsters, but at only 10%, it's really not going to make much of a difference either way. I do like the additional speed, though. Speed is an. Pretty much universally good trait, especially on the uh, slower factions uh, that really Most need it. Anyway, drives. well done to Aberash, and ooh, it looks like his army is full in terms of HP. Yeah. Hmm. And I noticed that we still can't use his recruitment Our field. Order. Yeah, it doesn't work. Aberash's recruitment field seems to be broken, unfortunately. I uh, would like to get some more Bloodkin Thralls, but we need to first actually free up the space, which we'll want to do by having the Abyssal Revenant evolve his. We need them to be level 7, right? Yeah, so we can start getting some Depth Guard in here. Okay, wait, let me just just figure this out. Uh, yeah, it should relax. Uh, you need to go into raiding. We'll want to hit the Quetza. Oh, it's gonna take a long time to get to Quetza. You can't cross over a ruined city? Hmm. That's unfortunate. But it is what it is. Probably want to wreck a few things here. Although I feel if we damage Itza too much, they might become too weak. On the other hand, wait. Is there anything still in range of the Blood Keeps or. Uh, mm -mm. 
back of the old one. I'm still kind of tempted to head down here, because if we... All right, I guess we're going this way. I really don't want to waste so many turns. I guess what we could do is... Mm, wait, if we march stance, just out of curiosity. All right, fine. I guess march stance. I'm going to hope that Vermont Bachman can still reach you. I was hoping to raid, but, uh, well. All right, go, go, go. And hopefully this doesn't screw our movement and we can still get here. It'll still take two turns by the looks of it, but, uh, well. It's better than four. Go figure. Uh, you need to raid. You know what? I think you're going to go back to the Awakening and just raid there. I was going to have him follow the Abyssal Revenant, but frankly, it's going to take too long to do that. Wallach. I guess you want to hang around here for a little while while Nong Chang builds up its library. Otherwise, we'll want to head down to Lamia, but we can't leave. But we're not at war with these guys. What we could do is declare war on Nakai if we wanted to. Um, but at the same time, destroying him may not be the best idea. Honestly, I kind of feel like the library is more important. Well, like, I think you just stay here for a couple turns. Uh, more turns of raiding is more metal, and thus, uh, well, it'll be better for us. You need to head to Castle Carcassonne. Uh, I guess you're going to go into regular movement. It's just going to take too long to raid our way there. And, hey, Clan Anger, and how dare you? We'll leave you alone, but nonetheless, and ooh. Ah, I was thinking King's Glade would be tier 5, but it ain't. I don't know if we get anything special by taking the Oak of Ages. Waterfall Palace is also tier 4, so also not worth our time. We're also, speaking of time, running out of time. And uh, don't want to fight anything here. Oh, we do have the Trident of Mathlan. Hmm, a moment. Are you able to leave your... Ah, you're not able to leave your stance, so we can't fight that one. The Brass Tower's Red Hound. How about that one? What do we have here? It's a worthy... Ooh... We have a lot of Cornet troops. Okay, yeah, we're fighting that. The Brass Tower's Red Hound. I like it very much. Uh, okay, no, not you. Well, let's hope that it works. And we will go into regular stance. Brass Tower's Red Hound. Another worthy foe. The Brass Tower's Mongrel Dog. This gives us Warrior of Ascendant Gear Dragon's Bane, which we already have, I think. But it also might give us a different one. Hrothgar, son of Grimmar, gore-clad warlord of Corn, the Berserker King, the Fist of Karnath, the Claw of the Hound, and the Blood Rager. So many titles, I hope this one's as mighty as his description. A Lance of the Bitter Wind, Frostbite Attacks, Wind Blast, and Armor Piercing Weapon Damage. I would probably give this to a Supporting Hero or... Maybe Legendary Hero? Eh. Frostbite isn't particularly great. I'm better off with Sundering Attacks and something like that. Armor Piercing Wind Weapon Damage is okay. Wind Blast is okay to have as well, but we can certainly put better items on uh, on straight-up lords, like an Obsidian Blade or the uh, Sundering Armor thing. But anyway, uh, let's teleport to you. And see what we've got against us. Uh, Skull Hunters with great weapons. Ooh, 72 weapon strength. These guys hit harder than we do quite, by quite a bit. And it's all, and lots of armor piercing damage in there. Skull hunters with non great weapons who still hit harder than we do. Just barely, though. Um, Blodvaskrar? Huh, what are you? Aspiring? Some kind of cornate aspiring champ. Oh, well, so what the heck is going on here? Uh, it's a broken texture, I guess. Oh, it's probably another cape issue. This The cape is probably covering him, like uh, somebody pointed out that there was a cape issue with the. Uh, the other battle, but that's all right. Uh, yeah, look at these guys. 120 weapon strength to 16 units, compared to our own 16 units, 66. They hit twice as hard as we do, or they, they hit twice as hard as our elite most infantry do. That's real interesting. All right, that looks like it's certainly worthy of a challenge. They also have a chilling aura, but it's not like we're going to run from them. And oh, they'll actually hit even harder. Because they'll have Berserk active, they'll have the Hungering Blades active, more weapon strength and more melee attack. They're unbreakable as well, so we have to kill them to a man. Their entire army is unbreakable, oh my. Oh, this might actually be a toughie. Just judging by unit stats, and considering we've had a fairly decently tough time against the monks and those Doomwolf units, I'm very excited. Go.
Norse Scouts' reports were indeed true, my children. This Norse camp is indeed massive, and should provide to be a formidable opponent. Be wary, for we have ventured far into the north, and undoubtedly forces have been arranged to ambush us. Engage the savage warriors of this land. Crush them beneath hoof and boot, for I demand a test of skill, and I shall not be denied. Alrighty, here we are. Exciting times, very exciting times indeed, as the enemy has some crazy looking units to uh, to contest us here. And in fact, unlike the battle against the massive piles of orcs and chaos dwarfs, we're going to have to maintain to some degree battle formations, lest our units get ripped apart. Look at those skull hunters. 86 weapon strength, magical damage dealings, so our physical resistance is useless, plus they have berserk and frenzy on them and are unbreakable as well uh, what do we have here I'm right, just gonna take a look at these guys all right nice uh, nice mix of armors and the helmets and whatnot excited to see how these guys uh, fare we've also got okay, these are more hunt uh, skull hunters I want to take a look at everybody before we uh, um, fight and look at this marauder chieftain of corn looking absolutely glorious here as well on that cornate a war mammoth here and that's a big boy up there with a big old axe is it big enough to threaten Aberash? I guess we'll have to see uh, Hrothgar Blood Rage. Is he a hound, or what's going on here? Oh, he's beneath the hound. Okay. I'm not sure what's going on over here. Could be a little more slaneshi than we were expecting in a coronate force, but, you know. Uh, <laughs> slanesh finds a way. <laughs> Oh, uh, anyway, here we go. We've got these guys as well. Uh, the aspiring champions of corn, and damn, those are some those are some heckin' power shoulders. Uh, they look making them look pretty darn big. Ooh, I like these ones especially. Uh, they're nice and uh, nice and unreasonably spiky. Yeah, very nice. But they still have the uh, sort of look of aspiring champions, especially uh, like this with those cloaks and the skulls and whatnot. All right. And they are going to be scared. Oh, wait, up to 144 weapon strength now. And that's without the uh, without their buffs up and running. 144. They hit literally twice as hard as our Disciples of the Path warriors do. Damn. Well, we are going to have to be careful. Anyway, Aberash will move in and go directly for the enemy. A lord, the mammoth may be big, but, uh, well, I'm sure the dragon that Aberash uh, drained was also pretty big, especially as I understand it was an elder dragon as well, uh, which are considerably more powerful. As like vampires, dragons get stronger with age. We're going to move in our units of the, uh, the Disciples of the Path inner circle get those zombie dragon breaths on cooldown but not yet move into actual combat as we once again do have to be careful about those enemy hyper elites we're gonna summon the uh, units of the phantom of the first keep and we're gonna summon some zombies to block off the aspiring champions so that they don't join the fray this will allow the circle of blood and the night riders to surround and destroy Krothgar blood rage while Aberash takes care of the other Marauder Chieftain, who has actually started to deal damage to him and has taken down his barrier. Well done, well done already. Uh, looking pretty good. While all this is happening and while the aspiring champions are distracted, we're going to have the Phantoms of the First Keep and the Disciples of the v uh, Disciples of the Path Knights charge in to those Skull Hunters with great weapons. Uh, let's see how that goes. And, well, we'll smash right into them, but not through them. And here we are. And oh wow, looks like, huh, looks like we took more damage from charging the enemy than the enemy took. I mean, they hit harder than our Disciples of the Path and do. We're a little bit more heavily armored, but I guess those great weapons and the bigger numbers of the enemy are really telling. I mean, the fact that they hit harder than we do, but have uh, 40 units compared to our 16. Damn. 
All right, these coronate units. So this is this is gonna be a tough fight. Anyway, we can leave the bl oh wow. <laughs> Wait, summon some zombies on the field and they immediately go flying. We'll allow the uh, units of the uh, phantoms to stick around while the zombies cover the retreat of the disciples of the path. We're gonna heal them up a little bit, get an invocation of the heck and an invocated oath up while our melee troops move in, or at least some of them do. It looks like the enemy had deployed a pile of uh, more skull hunters and aspiring champions over on the side and we'll send our blood dragons specifically to deal with them so four units of neophytes and two units of veterans to give uh, uh, to give a battle here all right and these guys will be facing off against each other and damn those aspiring champions are huge chaos steroids get uh, get uh, more powerful every day Especially this guy, damn. Yeah, they're like uh, they're like twice the size of our vampire units. Yeah, but they do... Oh, oh, no, they just... I was about to say, but they do fall, but it looks like those nearly fell down and still have to be worked through. It looks like our unit of Blood Dragon Neophyte Warriors has taken nearly half of its HP and damage. We're going to pop that Invocated Oath to give them the damage resistance and heal them and then back them through the rest of these units to allow them into combat. Out here, we have a Hung Conite Guard charging in. And we're going to hopefully allow the anti-large of the Depth Guard Deck Watchers, especially as they are a very defensive unit, to hold them off and destroy them. As this should be a weaker unit that we hopefully uh, can handle here. Aberash has finally defeated the enemy Marauder Chieftain of the Hound. He will... I keep wanting to say run him down. That doesn't quite apply. Well, I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be literally run him down, but... Uh... Well, I guess he does land, and there we go. Down and goes the Mammoth and the first of the enemy lords. The bounce of power remains in the enemy's favor, and we're still having a fairly tough fight on our hands. Undemn some scary units, but we are maintaining, if not quite a Death Star formation, several sort of formations. All the Blood Dragons are working together here to fight those three units of enemy elites. We have all of our uh, Disciples of the Path warriors fighting three more back here, though the Disciples of the Path has started to take damage as well. The Knights are down to half HP and have reached their healing cap by the looks of it, and this Disciples of the Path warrior unit is in pretty bad shape as well. We're going to have to get the... Uh, uh, these guys out of here as well, most likely. You're just gonna back them off and allow the zombies to distract those uh, corn mammoths and those uh, skull hunters and aspiring champions. More of the uh, conate, or wait, I was about to say conate guard, but now these are just hung horse archers sort of uh, are riding around, annoying us with their range attacks, but they're the least threatening units on the field by far, as they have basically no armor piercing damage, so we can by and large just ignore them. They'll be a threat pretty much only to our Bloodkin Aspirant as they try to knock him out of the sky. And ooh, looks like we've got some aspiring champions moving in to fight the Bloodkin Thralls and Depth Guard Deck Watchers, both of which are down to about half HP. And once again, looking absolutely tiny compared to the big Cornate boys. And down you go, sir. Hopefully we'll be able to bring you back up, but uh, will the Thralls and the Death Watchers, Death Watchers, Deck Watchers, aren't going to have a great time here. On the bright side, the Blood Dragons, though they have taken damage, have pretty much destroyed the three enemy units that decided to hit the rear of our column. And they did outnumber the enemy 5-3 uh, to three here. But they did good work. There we go. Those guys finally go down. We are still holding the line with our Disciples of the Path, and there's a lot of enemy units to hold back. It also does look like our Phantoms of the First Keep are pretty much done, and Aberash has entered the fray once more, fighting another Marauder Chieftain. And he continues taking damage and healing it right back up. We'll see how much more of this he can take before uh, before he reaches his healing cap. He's certainly not been able to recover his barrier throughout basically the entire battle, but he's also certainly found some worthy foes in the form of these Marauder Chieftains of the Hound. Oh, well done. 
All right, we also got to be real careful about our disciples of the path inner circle. If they get surrounded by these hyper elite units, uh, one of the uh, one of them can easily get ripped apart, especially with all the uh, very very heavy hitting units that the enemy has. It's possible that the size of the units of the aspiring champions is actually working against the enemy here, as they may be blocking off a decent portion of the enemy uh, skull hunters. Skull Hunters, was it? Now, yeah, Skull Hunters from uh, surrounding our units and uh, more of them from hitting us at the same time. Bounce of Power has finally shifted in our favor and Aberesh has dealt enough damage to one of the Marauder Chieftains to force him to back off and join the rest of his forces. But it uh, looks like the second Chieftain with whom he is still fighting has forced Aberesh to finally reach his healing cap. A first for this campaign. All right, very nice. Although I do once again wish that uh, the older, uh, the older units, the uh, mammoth units, and other similar uh, sort of older units that have the older animations, uh, were a little bit fancier, like the modern War Shrine animations that we have. It's just always just so hard to see the uh, unit sort of sitting up there while the mammoth that uh, does all the work. Certainly not something a coronate lord would uh, would countenance. Looks like our uh, champion or disciples of the path knights had to back off, but we have allowed them to heal back up even if they have reached their healing cap. They're gonna rip apart the uh, relatively fragile unit of horse archers. Mostly because they can't be in direct combat with the uh, Skull Hunters and Aspiring Champions at this time. Fortunately, the other of the enemy lords has dropped, and I believe Aberash has defeated the third and last one of them, and will run, fly, whatever him down. And yeah, look at that. 25% HP down to his healing cap. Aberash can no longer take damage, but he has defeated three enemy lords at this point, and those were the last on the field. Now we just gotta surround and destroy those Skull Hunters and other Cornate Elites that remain, but they're certainly giving us a heck of a fight here. What a great battle. Great looking units. Fantastic speech out of Aberash again. Truly a test of arms, and Aberash was not denied it, neither for himself nor for his children. And even though these guys are followers of Chaos, I'm sure Aberash would respect the fact that they are all unbreakable and will fight mm, to the death. I've, in fact, in vanilla, I've always been surprised that more Cornate units didn't have the unbreakable trait as I, uh, as I would have expected them to. It's always odd seeing uh, Cornate units around. Anyway, looks like another unit was sort of by itself here, but this one's obviously going to get surrounded as it is isolated, and it was already fairly heavily damaged. It clearly didn't rout, but I guess it just didn't want to fight whatever other units, uh, or with whatever other units uh, were out here. Maybe they had some sort of spat over, over who could collect the skulls, perhaps. All right. All right, well, the enemy lords have run off the... War speaker? Heck are you? Broken army losses. Uh, looks like an enemy hero here. Uh, but it looks like, unlike the unbreakable units, he's going to shatter. Well, he's not on the level of the uh, of the enemy lords anyway, so I'm sure he would have simply uh, uh, he would have simply been destroyed by Aberash anyway. Mammothor, no. All right, and by the looks of it, there are three enemy units on the field. These guys were waiting in the uh, trees here for some reason. I don't know if they were supposed to reinforce or they were supposed to ambush or there was some trigger that uh, didn't happen. Uh, but I guess they will only join the fray now. All right, and Aberash will land upon these guys back here. And just to distract them for as long as he can. And we're going to move his inner circle to join him while the rest of our entire army fight the other two. And with the enemy distracted by Aberash, the inner circle knights will be able to hit them in the back. Lots of uh, armor piercing and damage coming into the enemy. And we've hit very hard with that 250 damage on these guys as well. And I'm sure that Abrosh would have been able to... Well, actually, he took a little bit more damage. Damn, he's down to 60% healing cap. 
All right, knocking the last of these guys out. They do get ripped apart by the elite blender that we have in the form of Aberash and his inner circle here. And then we just got to blend the rest of the Coronate Warriors. And once again, fantastic fight from these guys. Gotta love the, uh, the hyper elites that the enemy have in this mod. There we go, and charging into the back of them. Now they are surrounded, and the last of the Coronate Warriors will fall. And this blood is ours and will belong to no Dark God. And I think that's okay. Now there's one more unit in here, I think, somewhere. Four more units, but I am having a difficult time spotting them in the melee. Either way, with that, the... Oh, wait, no, there he is. There's one. There's one. <laughs> okay, they all just mob him, and the last of the enemy units will fall, and the battle will be ours. A second heroic victory. Two heroic victories for Avarash in a single episode. Uh, that's, uh, well, that's got to be a record. Very nice. Ooh, there we go. That was the toughest worthy foe fight so far, or at the very least, the toughest big blob of super elite units. Those coronate champions, honestly, all the coronate units were freaking insane. Our uh, Disciples of the Path charged into one of the, I think it was just one of the Skull Hunters, not even an aspiring champion unit, and lost about half HP while the enemy was barely damaged at all. What a scary pile of truly worthy foes. Damn, I am enjoying these quests immensely and I'm loving the fact that uh, we've reached the point where we actually have to think about how we handle each individual unit, mob them with our own units, etc, etc, as otherwise they will uh, be able to rip our own units apart. The two unit of Depth Guard nearly died just trying to hold off some of those enemy units and we weren't really able to use the Bloodkin at all as they would have just, uh, they would have just gotten ripped apart and a few hits. Damn. Damn. Oh, and on top of that, Aberash reached his healing cap. We have never seen this happen yet. He reached his healing cap and dropped to about 60% of his HP. So even the challenge for Aberash himself. Corn is truly worthy. Uh, we are going to... I mean, maybe we can auto-resolve the greenskins, or maybe I'll fight it between the episodes. There's not a little greenskin army nearby, but it ain't all that worth our time. Let's let's heal up for now, as we do want to keep moving. There's that Lance of the Bitter Wind, but we'll want to switch that right back on Wallach. In fact, I'm going to do it right now before I forget. You need to get your Crimson Blade. There we go. Yeah, I'm going to pop these legendary weapons on somebody. <laughs> They're obviously not good enough to uh, pop on the uh, legendary heroes, and I'll con continue thinking about who actually needs them. Anyway, oh wait, actually, no, not anyway. Aberash, did you actually receive something? Talisman. Oh, we got the Dragon Crest reforged for this battle, not for that other battle. And this gives us... Okay, so it's an upgrade to this. And we keep armor piercing, or heart piercing rather, but we gain this, the Sword of Unholy Power, which gives us additional power recharge and reserves per second, which is nice. And which is nice, but uh, I think we need some uh, upgraded armor bits. Uh, I guess this is probably the final level of it, Gauntlets of the First Sword. We still need a new cape, torso, and possibly helm, although... It is yellow, and this one's purple. I imagine that we want to upgrade them all to yellow bits, just judging by what we've gotten so far. Hmm. Interesting. Well, either way, we get to two more turns until another worthy foe encounter, but I believe... Wait, Clash with the Chittering Horde? Yes, will give us another Arcane Forge Breastplate. Oh, hello. Well, that sounds fun. 
Well, it sounds fun, but alas, we are very, very much out of time. We won't be able to uh, funinate it here. We'll have to uh, wait until uh, next turn or next episode. Uh, maybe Still not next right. turn. I don't know. I'll think about it. Either way, I am calling the episode here some absolutely glorious battles this time and hopefully some more absolutely glorious battles to come. So stay tuned for more Blood Dragons. Don't forget to leave those likes and comments below, especially the threshold. All glory to the algorithm. Thanks for watching.